Well, folks, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, those of you who might be watching at home, we, uh, we welcome you in. Welcome everybody that's here in person. Uh, the sun's kind of almost trying to shine now, but uh, you couldn't have said that an hour ago because you couldn't see the sun. It was so cloudy and rainy out there. But I'm sure we need the rain. Maybe it'll cool it off for a little bit. Looks like we're going to get a little bit more of that. But let me open this up with a word of prayer, and we'll uh, take a look and, and pray together over the folks on our prayer list. Let's pray together. Lord God in heaven, we thank you, Father, that you are who you are. And God, we thank you that in you being you, Father, you choose to not only have created us, but to love us even in, in our shortcomings and our sin. And Father, because of that, Father, you give us Jesus Christ and give us, therefore, the opportunity to be forgiven of our sin, to know you in an intimate and growing and dynamic relationship throughout all of eternity to come. Lord God, we praise you for that. We pray, Lord, that we are taking advantage of that opportunity that you give us, that free thing, that free gift that we couldn't achieve or, or, or accomplish on our own. But we thank you and praise you tonight that you give that to us freely. And Lord, that that shows us your love for us and so much more. Lord God, would you help us now as we look to our prayer list and, and, and talk about and update one another on those that we've been praying for and the new ones that are, will be added this week. Father God, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to seek your will in our lives and their lives as well and trust you in whatever you choose to do according to your will. Be with us now, Lord, and let our time together be beneficial in our walk with you and glorifying to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, all right, we, uh, we've got a Wednesday night before VBS breaks loose on Sunday evening, so it's kind of literally the calm before the storm. So lots of folks are have been working through the week and getting things decorated and have, having meetings here and there and things like that. Um, so just to, to update you, um, Sunday evening we'll start VBS. There'll be a, uh, a meal at 5.30 in here, and then uh, 6 o'clock we'll start VBS, the actual program of it, and then we'll uh, go on till 8.00. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys tonight, those of you that are here with us, and if you want to comment, if you're watching at home, we'll, we'll look at the comments as well. Um, what you, would guys, you guys would like to do as a group, we're pretty much a standard group that's in here on Wednesday evenings and Sunday evenings. Um, would you all like to just simply meet in another room in our church, and, or would you like to do something more specific, something that lines up with BBS? Uh, what, what would you guys like to do this coming Sunday evening for Bible study and then next week? We have business meetings scheduled. Obviously, we can't do business meetings in the middle of VBS. That probably won't work very well, so we're going to have to bump that back a week. That's, that's just part of having VBS that week. So. Bible just made it in another room. Okay. All right. There will be, uh, you know, of course, VBS spreads out, so the sanctuary will be being used. Um, uh, this room will be being used. So what we'll probably do is, it, why, why don't we meet in, um, the choir room's got, why don't we get you guys some more comfortable chairs? Would that be good? Right. Yeah. Why don't we meet in Grady's Sunday school room there, uh, the adult four Sunday school class. We'll meet there Sunday evening uh, and have our time. We'll, we'll go ahead and meet at our regular time, and uh, we'll have a short time of Bible study. And then we'll, uh, we'll if you want to stick around, if you're working VBS, we'll, of course, let you. We'll excuse you for that. If you're not working, we'll just kind of watch and hang out with folks, and we'll have, let you have time to do that. And then if, uh, if not, then we'll get you out of the fray, you know, before it all starts going good and crazy Sunday evening. And then we'll do the same thing Wednesday night, and then we will we'll have a uh, business meeting move back from the, uh, from the 9th, which is when it was originally scheduled, to the 16th. Okay? All right, with that said, let's take a look at our prayer list together, and let's see uh, some folks that we need to be praying for. Uh, as, as you may already know and have already been praying for them, or ones that we'll, you'll hear about for the first time tonight and begin to, to pray for them. Uh, just going alphabetically through, um, we, we talked about the family of Jennifer Taylor and her passing away. Continue to remember them. That was uh, something that she had been struggling with her health for a long time, uh, but certainly nothing that they could have prepared for. So continue to pray for the Taylor family, for Tim, uh, and for the kids there. Also, as far as updates and additions, uh, Brandy Cockrell, uh, by the way, Steel and Brandy, we, we are, we're, we're expecting them the 6th, Sunday. They're actually already on field right now. They've gone with the youth to, uh, to go eat and, uh, and to fellowship with them, get to know them a little bit. So you, some of you got to see them just a second ago as they came through. Uh, but Brandy has, if you notice, she had a boot on one of her feet and uh, on one of her ankles there. And she's, uh, she thinks she's broken a bone in her foot. She's still waiting to see the doctor and find out for sure. But she's just in a lot of pain. And, uh, and, and that's not what a teacher wants. Uh, at the beginning of summer, you know, they, that, that's not the, uh, that's not, you don't want summer to be limited in any way if you're just getting out of a school year. So pray for Brandy and, uh, and, and we're so glad to have 
both of them, they're two sweet boys here. Um, you don't have to tell them I called them sweet, but they're nice guys. So we're glad to have that family with us. Um, Catherine Liddell, uh, I think Ms. Ethel brought up last week. Uh, Catherine has been diagnosed with a, a particular type of headache that is, uh, is very, very painful. Uh, and I don't know all of it. Uh, it's the same thing from what I understand talking to Kayla that, uh, that Thomas Hathorne suffers from. And some of you might see his post on Facebook. He's, he's posted about it a good bit if you're friends with Thomas. Uh, so pray for Catherine as she, uh, as she finds treatment and, uh, and, and ways to adapt and, and ways to, to alleviate that pain of those headaches uh, that come on. It, it, it's, it's more, you know, when we just say headaches, it sounds like, oh, well, we all get headaches. These are not those. These are, these are big time. Um, they, they have some serious, serious pain um, associated with them. Miss Janice Spitchley has hurt her shoulder, and uh, that's not good for uh, any of us, but certainly those of us that play the piano. Uh, so we want to pray for Miss Janice as she, uh, she gets to recover from that injury and uh, hopefully get some relief from the pain there. Um, we were I just, just heard from Miss Shirley Burkett here that, that she, uh, she's been to the doctor today, and, and we've been praying for her uh, to get some relief for the pain in her back and her legs, and they've got a plan that, that should be able to relieve a good bit of that pain with the, with the stimulator they're going to put in here. Don't know when yet, she said, but we're going to find out, and uh, we'll be praying for Miss Shirley in that. So continue to lift her up. Uh, Miss Jan has got her scan coming up here. Uh, Jan, remind me of the date. Is it the 11th? <laughs> well, we, we can't put bright lights on the paper, so bold is all we can do. So, it is the 11. I want, I want to make sure I got that date right, but uh, but we're praying. Well, we're going to pray for perfect results. You've been blessed with so many good results, even in the midst of the things you've been dealing with with your cancer and, and with your health. So we're we're going to pray that you get that you blow that test out of the water. <laughs> And uh, we're going to praise the Lord as he does that. Uh, Grady handed me a note just before we got started. A friend of, of his and Jan's is Robert Mariscalco. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, if anybody knows, please correct me. Um, uh, but he is, uh, he's suffering from cancer as well and, uh, and, and having uh, to go. Grady, where did you say he's going? Uh, so pray for Robert and for his family. Um, as well as his friends, Jan and Grady and others, as he, uh, as he battles cancer as well. Um, you see down there that Jamie Smith, um, one of our recent graduates, high school graduates, is, is bolded as well as an update. She is heading off in just a matter of days to Air Guard boot camp. So she'll be going to boot camp and then straight to tech school and then get to come back home. So that's, uh, that's of course, a huge thing in, in her life and for her family. So we want to, first off, thank the Lord that... that Young folks like Jamie, are, you know, are still going into the service, and you know, it's not like it used to be. The thing, a lot of things have changed, uh, but we're thankful that, that that God is still calling upon the hearts and the, and the lives of, of young people to go into the service and, and to be a part of protecting our freedoms and and fighting for us as as needs be. So pray for Jamie, pray for Kim, and for James and for the rest of the family. As uh, as as if any of you sent one off, I'm sure that can't be a an easy thing to do. You can't, it's hard to send them off to the store, much less to the military. So. Uh, continue to pray for the Smith family as well. Um, I did go by Antioch Baptist Church is on our on our list down there under prayer and missions, and uh, did go by there the other day, and uh, they've they've got they've got a roof on, so that, that, it looks good from the outside. I didn't stop in to you know didn't look like anybody was there to, to talk to, but uh, but so they're they're working on that. We didn't get a chance the other day after Wayne and I talked to go over and help them out, but if they need some things going forward, they of course had roof damage in one of the recent storms and and uh, had, a, had a, a pretty tough situation in their church, fa uh, church facility. So, How about you? What uh, updates or, or additions do you have? Uh, Brother Richard, my cousin, Lane Sandifer, lost his wife this week. Okay. She oh. died um, yesterday morning. She lost her battle with Alzheimer's. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> and that's Wayne's Wayne Sandifer's right, wife. wife. We'll definitely lift them up and the whole Sandifer family, goodness. And Elizabeth Wade, she, I'm not sure if she's on the breast until she has the baby, but I know she's breast. Okay. <laughs> now, now, does her doctor know that she's scheduled to work VBS next week? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why she's really breast. I understand. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
they have found a place to live. Uh, the Hicks family has found a place to live, and we're actually about to work with our missions committee as well as the rest of the church in sort of trying to help them get furnishings um, because obviously they lost everything. And so uh, trying to work and see what we can do there. So that you'll be hearing about that in the, in the weeks to come to, uh, to help them out. But we're thankful that they have found a, a place to live and, and, and are, are kind of trying to inch back towards normalcy after such a huge loss of losing their house in the fire. What? Any other updates or additions? Oh, my brother Andy still can't see well out of his eye. They can't tell me why. Bless his heart. Except that probably caused from less than an hour COVID. But, wow. but they said it. They don't know. It might, I guess that might all come back. They don't know. Mm, just, just when we think we know enough about stuff, we realize there's so much more that we don't know. I'm so sorry he's dealing with that. Has he had any opportunity to preach lately? He's been preaching down at Gum Springs for several weeks. See, you don't have to be able to see good to preach. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's all right. In fact, it helps to not be able to see those clocks that churches like to put up there. So uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Now if I can just learn to not hear when people tell me I went too long, that's a different, that's a different story. So. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I, plan, I don't plan on starting. <laughs> I can't tell time. That's a, <laughs> y'all know that in a lot of ways, not just how long I preach. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's take a moment and uh, and circle up around your tables and uh, and take a moment to pray for whoever and and whoever's that the Lord has put on your heart, and then I'll close us in prayer in just a moment.
Father, again, Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity in your love that we have to share our burdens with you. And Father, we know that when we are in your will, our burdens are your burdens, and we ask you to continue to, to show us what should burden our hearts and the things that we should focus on, not only in our, in our prayer life, but in our life as we live out um, a, a life of faith. Lord God, we do thank you, Father, for the many ways that you are healing people in our midst that have been sick, that are hurting, uh, that, have, that have been uh, diminished in so many different ways. Thank you for bringing them back to strength, back to, to, uh, to being closer to whole. Lord God, we know that you work in our bodies better than any medicine ever could. We thank you, Father, for the way that you, uh, for the way that you have allowed knowledge about the human body and about the things that, that can, can treat the human body and the many ailments that we have. We thank you, Lord, but we know that it's not uh, simply from the power of medicine, but rather from what you have allowed uh, to bring mercy to your people. So, Lord God, we celebrate you and thank you for that. Lord God, in our church, we're so thankful for what you're doing. We thank you for Steele and for Brandy, Lord, looking forward to their ministry here. And, Lord, we know that, that you have brought them to us. And, Father, help us to not only welcome them in, but join them and let them join us in the way of following your will through serving this community and serving the people of this church. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for the week that is to come uh, of Vacation Bible School, Lord. We ask that you, uh, that you bring kids in, in whatever numbers you choose to bring them. And, Father, for each child that comes, each child that's a part, each worker that's a part, each family that's impacted, Father, we pray that it would be a blessing of sharing your gospel, of enjoying fellowship with your people, and, Father, seeing new, new children and, who knows, maybe even adults come to faith in Christ. Lord God, would you bless our Bible school, bless the efforts that are going on even right now as, as many groups and people are getting ready for different parts uh, that they'll be playing in, uh, in the Vacation Bible School week. Lord God, help it to be a, a, a shining example of how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, Father, for that gospel, for it is truly the power unto salvation for those of us that believe. We love you, Lord. Now, would you speak to us in your word in these next few moments and let us glorify you by not only hearing your word, but by turning around and as you teach it to us, taking us and letting us do your word in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's right. We, uh, we are going to have a potluck for Steele and Brandy and their family to welcome them in. Um, and we will have that on the 13th. So not this Sunday. Obviously, the VBS going on, that was tough. Uh, so Steele's jumping right into the fire. He's already been asked to play a role in the, in the wrap-up session of VBS. But so the following Sunday, a week from this Sunday, we'll have a potluck, uh, dinner on the grounds after, after morning worship. And uh, so we'll, we'll be putting out some text messages and things like that and give you some reminders as we go and uh, get all that going. But then we'll do that. And uh, if you, uh, you just want to come and fellowship with Steele and Brandy, get to know them a little bit, also enjoy a great time of fellowship with everybody else in the church, that would be a great time to do that on the 13th right after morning worship. Well, uh, Lord willing, this, uh, this Sunday we'll start a new series. It'll be our summer series. It'll actually span over about two months, uh, June and July. And uh, we'll be taking a look at, 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 the, uh, at, a, at a pretty big topic <laughs> through, through a book of the Bible. But the topic is this, and the name of the series is Worthy of the Gospel. Um, what we're going to read out of Romans here in just a minute is uh, it, it speaks to our worthiness of the gospel as far as do we deserve to have the gospel given to us. Uh, what the sermon series, though, will, will, will speak to will be more of once we have received the gospel, once we have submitted to, the, to, to Jesus as Lord of the gospel and, and submitted our lives to him and found faith in him, once that happens, then we should live worthy of the gospel. It's not that we came into this world worthy of it, other than the fact that God said he wanted to give it to us, and he did, so I guess that makes us worthy. But once we've been saved by the, the message of the gospel, by the power of Jesus, once we're saved by him, well, then now we have a commitment. We've made a commitment in our salvation to live a life that would be worthy of the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. So in, as we look today, uh, just for a few moments, to Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 9, um, we see a, a fundamental truth that we've got to make sure we understand when it comes to our relationship with God, especially when it comes to um, how we think about ourselves and how other people that we might be witnessing to might think about themselves when it comes to who can be saved and what salvation means. 
Um, in, in the book of Romans, Paul is, uh, is, is writing to uh, the church at Rome, many of them Jewish in their background and, and in their faith before converting or giving their life to Jesus, uh, but also writing to Gentiles. And so he, he goes through the, the, uh, the, the importance of the law of the Old Testament, and he talks a lot about what the law can do and what the law doesn't do. And then he equates that to, or, or, or better yet, properly links that to who Jesus is and the message of the gospel. And so through understanding the law, they understand and we can understand that the law in and of itself is not complete, but Christ comes to complete it. And the gospel is the completed effect, the completed power of what the law started off in the Old Testament. And so if you are a Jewish person in this new first century when Christianity is becoming uh, not only a movement but a, a powerful force that's becoming a new faith that people are surrendering their lives to and learning how to live in and honoring Christ, um, there, there was a, a reasonable question that, that would be asked. And, and one would be, well, don't the Jews have kind of a leg up in this situation? Don't they have an advantage? Don't they have a head start in this? Uh, so think about that for a second. I mean, if, if, uh, if there was a group of people who had, who had had a relationship with God and then God chooses to send a person, Jesus in this case, to complete the understanding of that relationship, it would make sense, wouldn't it, that the people who already knew this God would have a better idea of it. Well, what we find out is, is that they, they did have maybe the opportunity for that, but they didn't understand their opportunity. They didn't understand where they stood with God as God's chosen people, as they indeed were, and as the Jews indeed are. Um, they didn't understand that. And so there was a lot of misunderstanding in this. And so some of the things that they thought were their ad advantages in being Jewish and already knowing the great I am, God, Jehovah, God, um, they, they were out of whack in what they understood. They, they thought about it in different ways. So much so that in this time, there were a lot of people who would come around to these new Christian churches and preach to them and, and, and even sometimes uh, threaten them that if they weren't also converting to Judaism, they couldn't be part of God's kingdom in Christ. Um, and that, of course, we see throughout the New Testament is, is not the case. We don't have to become Jewish in order to become Christian. We don't have to uh, become a, a converted Jew and, 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 and all of the practices and, and, and regulations that go with that in order to honor Christ. The New Testament simply teaches us that. And Jesus even tells us that, that, that that's not necessary. But still, even after Jesus' earthly ministry, his crucifixion, and his, his death and his resurrection... And even in the, the weeks after that he appeared to them in his resurrected body before ascending to heaven, he, he was making the way for all to come to know him, and yet still there was this misunderstanding. So there's this misunderstanding that, okay, well, if I'm Jewish, then I'm in a special class when it comes to faith in Christ. Um, they might have even thought, and there's reason to believe that they would have thought, that if they were Jewish, that some of the things that applied to the sinners of the world didn't necessarily apply to them because they were already part of God's people. And so therefore they must be better off or more deserving of this Jesus than anybody else. And that's where Paul in Romans chapter 3 starting with verse 9 uh, starts to speak into this situation. He, he actually speaks into it in the first three chapters, uh, first two chapters preceding this, but, uh, but it really, uh, the, the rubber hits the road right here. In verse 9 uh, we read in Romans chapter 3, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. Talking about for being Jewish. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, 
through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, what he's saying here is, that, and he quotes a lot from the Psalms. It's not one particular Psalm. It's not sequential order of the Psalms, not chronological order through the Psalms. He quotes s several lines in this passage that we've just read from the book of Psalms. And, and all of them speak to the condition of everyone's heart apart from Christ. The, the big thing that we have to understand in our faith is that we, we don't come to Jesus as good people and he makes us better. That, that's a lot of times the way that we kind of deal with each other. That's a lot of times the way that we think of one another and think of ourselves, isn't it? Uh, a lot of times we think about, well, you know, they're good people. They just don't go to church. Or, well, they're just good people. They just believe in something else. There's nothing wrong with saying that somebody is a good person if you're saying, well, they're kind to people. Well, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're a, a nice neighbor. They're, uh, they, you know, they care for people. They, they do a good job taking care of their family. There's nothing wrong with saying that in our culture that they are good. What comes to be the, the issue here is when we start to equate being good and being godly. Those aren't the same thing. And certainly not when we're talking about good being those things that we just mentioned. Just being a, a nice person. Someone who hasn't broken a lot of the law of the land. Someone who's never been to prison. Someone who wouldn't hurt anybody. So on and so forth. We always talk about people as being, well, they're good people. You know? May, they're not even in a situation of, well, they're good because I like them and we have a lot in common. When we're talking about being godly, there's only one way, scripturally speaking, to be godly. And that is through the power of Jesus Christ through the message of the gospel, coming in and taking us from death in sin and bringing us to life in him. That's the only way that at judgment, where it really counts, where it's not just our words about each other, but when it's actually what's going on in judgment about to happen, sitting there or standing there before the Lord, there's only one way to be considered godly, and it has nothing to do with how much jail time we've spent or not spent, or how good we are to our families, or how, how sacrificial we are with our money, or, or how you know, we share our talents. With, it has nothing to do with any of that. It simply has to do with what has happened where Jesus is concerned in our lives and in our hearts. Are we still on our own having never submitted to Jesus and therefore dead in sin and going to be part of those who are cast away from God for all of eternity? Or have we given our hearts and lives to Jesus in, to in totality and in fullness and then therefore we'll be ushered in to our reward, which is eternity in heaven? Those are the two possibilities. There's no grades of being good or bad. I, you know, I think it's important as Christians when we talk about our sin, when we talk about looking forward to heaven, that we don't just say, well, you know, I hope he's going to let me in. Because we can know whether or not he's going to let us in. And we should know whether or not we're gonna, he's going to let us in. Because we know whether or not we've surrendered our lives and our way of thinking to him or not. We know if that's happened, we know what our thoughts are, we know what, what our habits are and why we do them a lot of times, and, and we know are they to glorify the Lord or are they just because it fits into my culture or my family or what people expect of me or what makes people say good things about us. Um, we shouldn't just hope that he's going to let us in. The gospel gives us clear understanding that can be ours and should be ours for those of us who put our faith in Christ, that we are forgiven. Why? Because he's done everything that needed to be done and we have submitted to who he is. Um, and so he's asking these questions and, he's, and he's, he's quoting the Psalms here to point out the fact that it has nothing to do with people being good because when it comes to goodness in the Lord, there's nobody that's good. Jesus even says, you know, when he's asked, a uh, good teacher, he's called a good teacher, he says, why do you call me good? No one's good except for who? God. And so God is holy, and we are not. So therefore, it's not, you know, like I said, it's not a sliding scale of good and better and best and things like that. There's holy and there's unholy. And it doesn't take but a hint of sin to be made from holy to being unholy. And every one of us is born with a nature to sin. Not just a hint of it, a nature to sin. Here lately I've been uh, taking some time to, uh, especially late at night, to take old videotapes and put them on the computer of the girls, you know, when they were little bitty babies and, and, and toddlers. And, uh, and man, you can see in those sweet little girls' eyes some love for their mom and dad and some mischief that they loved us enough to where they would keep us on our toes by the minute we turned our, you know, our eyes off of them. You can see us like come into the frame to pick something up and man, they're all, the, the camera picks it up. They're, they're running off to go do what we just told them not to do, right? <laughs> that, that doesn't sound real sinful, but that's, that's, that's where that is. I mean, that, you know, that's why that, that mischievous thing 
is, is, the, is the root of sin in our lives, right? I mean, and we, we do that with the Lord as well. We know what not to do and we do it. We know what to do and we don't do it. And that's sin, the Bible says. Uh, and so we're born with this sinful nature. He says in verse 9, what shall we conclude then? He's been discussing whether or not Jews have an advantage or not. He says, do we have any advantage? Not at all. Well, I mean, they do have, as he's mentioned already uh, in, in a previous passage, that they do have the blessings of God. They've been, you know, they have this heritage in the Lord. But when it comes to being holy or godly or righteous, they have no advantage whatsoever. Why? He says, for we have already made the, cha the charge that Jews and Gentile are alike, all of us, under the power of sin. We're all under the power of sin. The best person we know was born into a sinful nature. The worst person we know was also born into a, certain, a sinful nature. We've all been born that way. Jews, Gentiles. Of course, knowing that Gentiles means not Jewish, so everybody else. We're all born into this, he says. And then he starts in verse 10 to quote these Psalms. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's the same Psalm that Jesus quoted in that passage that we just referenced a moment ago. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Now, does that mean that, that nobody wants to know about God? No, not necessarily. What it does mean, though, is there is no one who can in and of themselves approach, discover, and attain God without God being a part and doing the work. Our faith, we do have, I believe with all my heart from Scripture, we do have a choice as to whether or not to submit to the Lord. But we don't earn our salvation by making decisions. We don't earn our salvation by doing good. We don't earn our salvation by studying about the Bible and about Jesus and about who, the God, who God is and who we as people are. We only are brought to salvation when God, through his and his power alone, convicts our heart and draws us to him. It says no one, there's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. What he's referring to here is that there's no one who can achieve, who can do it on their own terms we can't do it it has to be god at work in us um, now some people take that to an extreme and say that therefore we have no choice that's a totally different bible study on a totally different topic but rest assured regardless of what you believe about free you know power of free free will uh, or, or choice or anything like that god has to do the work to bring us to salvation verse 12 he says all have turned away they have together become worthless there is no one who does good, not even one. This is looking at what a person, any person, or any group of people are able to do on their own apart from God. What can they do? Well, they turn away. They've become worthless. There's no one that does good, not even one. Now, it, it may sound like, man, the Bible sure does have a negative view of people. Uh, aren't people just good? I mean, I, you know, people like to say, well, I think people are basically good. Well, if you're talking about, for the most part, people are nice to each other and desire to be nice, again, that's fine. But if you're talking about in the eyes of the Lord, the holy God, him looking at them and saying they are good based on what he is that is good, well, that's not the case. We're not good, none of us, because all these things apply to all of us. That's a big difference. That's a big difference from saying, well, they're good people, and then they got saved, and now they're the best possible them they could be. Now they're active in church. They're raising their kids in the Bible. We don't go from good people to godly people. We go from ungodly people to godly people. Doesn't mean we're not nice. Doesn't mean we're not, you know, fun to be around. Doesn't mean that we're not charitable and all these other things. Doesn't mean we can't love, but we can't do the things of God that we are called to do once we put our faith in him because on our own we cannot do it he goes on to, to describe it some more in verse 13 their throats are open graves that's pretty direct isn't it <laughs> you know it, it's one thing if I came up to you and said oh you know what Mr. George you said some things and I just don't know if that was the best thing to say but man if I come up and say Mr. George your mouth is like your throat is like an open grave that's pretty direct and to the point right that, that's pretty graphic I mean that's basically saying that the only thing that comes out of our mouth is is filthy and dead <coughs> and for a Jewish person especially a dead body a dead carcass was especially filthy in a spiritual sense not just in a ew, gross sense he says, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Now, 
we know a lot of good people who are nice to each other, right? But what ends up happening when that good person gets offended most of the time? They strike back, don't they? When they get talked about, they talk back. They talk about the person or talk to the person. Um, you know, a lot of the people that we would say that are nice and kind, don't cross them because they're equally as vengeful. <laughs> they're equally uh, as, as prone to, to bitterness as the rest of us, as even the meaner people who aren't so nice. So what he's saying here is true. We see it play out all the time. But what he's doing here is he's saying that people in and of ourselves, we're not able to say the things that glorify God unless he allows us to, unless he calls us to, unless he convicts us, brings us from death and sin to life in Christ to give us that righteousness to be able to do that. He says their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. I think they've been watching the news in 2021 talking about this, right? I mean, think about all the things that are going on. All the people that are killing each other. Uh, all the ones that are battling over things that some of them have been battling over for longer than they can even imagine. Some of them that are fighting new fights and new issues here. But this is how people end up being. Even the ones that we would say would be good, nice, kind and so forth. He says, verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Remember that when we're talking about the Bible saying that no one's good, it's talking about in the economy of God, talking about in who God is, and talking about in a holy way. Somebody might say, oh, well, man, if, I mean, how are you going to get people to come and put their faith in Christ if you tell them they're terrible? Well, make sure you tell them in the right way and make sure as you're telling them that you say, and that's who I was too. <laughs> and that's who all of us were. It's not just, oh, us saved people tell you lost people how terrible you are. No, we are all this way. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. We're all that way. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Why? Why does the law say to us that we are not able to do and to honor God on our own. He says, it says to them under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. It's foundational to our faith that if we can be good enough on our own, we don't need God. But because we can't, we have a huge need for God. And electricity. You saw that flicker. We'll, we'll see if we can wrap this up. Uh, and we're almost there. Verse 20, the last verse we read together. Therefore, because of this, because no one is good, he says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. He's speaking to these Jewish people who have for generations done what they thought they were supposed to, trying to do what God's law said. They didn't understand that the whole point of the law was to point towards Christ. And yes, you could follow God and be faithful to God, but you could never please God by following the law and be righteous in his eyes that way, the way that we can through putting our faith in Christ. He says, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. That means at judgment, no one will be uh, brought in apart from Christ in their lives. He says, rather, through the law, we became conscious, conscious of our sin. It's important that we're conscious of our sin. And that's the whole point this evening. As we go into, Lord willing, if he doesn't wash us away in this rain that's starting to come down right now, if we get to Sunday morning and, and the Spirit's still moving in this direction, we're going to talk about living lives worthy of the gospel. But we've got to make sure we understand in that, that God didn't look down on us and say, I'm going to save these people out in Harrisville because they're good folks. No, he looked down on us and saw us all at every one of us and at every point in our life before we gave our life to him. He saw us as dead in our sin. And he chose to forgive us out of his own goodwill, out of his own love, and then to teach us what that love and that goodwill looks like that we should live it out from there. I don't know whether or not to open up another passage since it sounds like it may rain for a little bit more, Mr. JP. Uh, but I won't do that. I'm going to see if we can get you out. Maybe there'll be a break and, and you can get in there. Uh, but I hope this evening that the Lord didn't, didn't discourage you, but he encourages you to know that as bad as we are on our own, Christ can bring us to righteousness as we put our faith in him. Let me pray for us as we wrap up. Lord God, we do love you and we thank you, Father, for your righteousness and the righteousness that is, is available to us only through the person, the work, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Lord God, help us to not put stock on our own goodness, but rather to put our faith firmly and squarely in you, that we might know you and live in you and glorify you because of Christ bringing us to life away from death and our sin. 
Help us, Lord, to go out and to live these lives. And Lord, if you so choose, help us to, to be effective as witnesses in our community each and every place we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.